Hi, it's Mrs. Ferris from Wood Library with my friend Bernard, and it's time for some bedtime stories. So let's get started. Our first book tonight is by Kiko Kaza, and it's called Finders Keepers. Have you ever found something and decided you should keep it? Hmm, that's what happens here. This is published by G.P. Putnam and Son. One day, a squirrel found a big acorn. Yay! Finders keepers, he cried. I'm going to save this for later, thought Squirrel. So he dug a hole and buried it. And then he left his hat to mark the spot. You stay put, hat, said the squirrel, and I'll be back tomorrow. But once the squirrel had gone, oh, the wind began to blow. It lifted the hat higher and higher until, oh, it landed in a tree next to a little bird. Wow, what a terrific nest, cried the bird. Finders keepers. She snuggled into her new nest, but soon it began to wobble. It wobbled and wobbled until it fell into a nearby stream and the hat quickly floated along until an ant spotted it. Yippee! What a nice boat, cried the ant. Finders keepers. So the ant hopped on board and sailed on and on until splash. A big wave nearly turned the boat upside down. What was that? cried the ant. Can you tell what it is? We'll see in a minute. It was a bear. Hey, look at this. What a perfect clown nose, cried the bear. Finders keepers. Now wearing his handsome red nose, the bear juggled and juggled until well, his nose started to tickle. Do you remember who said that? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, choo! <laughs> the bear's nose went flying. And it flew and flew until finally it landed near a flower patch. Well, you know what? The next day the squirrel returned. Well, there you are, he said to his hat, exactly where I left you. He dug up his acorn and happily munched away. Mmm, yummy. And that was the end of the story until someone else came along. Do you see what he sees? What a cool hat, cried the snake. Finders keepers. And I think the top of that acorn makes a perfect hat for him. So that's finders keepers. Shall we do a finger play? Let's see here, which one could we do? Hmm. I don't think I know any about hats, so we'll have to come up with something different. Which one would you like to do? Oh, you'd like to do the monkeys jumping on the bed? Oh, I like that one. Can you get your monkeys ready? I've got five little monkeys. They're jumping on the bed. When one fell off, oh, he bumped his head. So his mama called the doctor and the doctor said, no more monkeys jumping on the bed. So can you show me four? One, two, three, four. So four little monkeys were jumping on the bed. One fell off and bumped his head. So mama called the doctor and the doctor said, no more monkeys jumping on the bed. So that means three little monkeys were jumping on the bed. One fell off and bumped his head. So mama called the doctor and the doctor said, 
No more monkeys jumping on the bed. So now two little monkeys were jumping on the bed. One fell off and bumped his head. So mama called the doctor and the doctor said, no more monkeys jumping on the bed. So that left one little monkey jumping on the bed. When she fell off, oh, she bumped her head. So mama called the doctor and the doctor said, no more monkeys jumping on the bed. So there are no more monkeys, but you know what's in our next book? A snarly hyssopus. Really? That's what it's called. This is written by Alan McDonald with illustrations or pictures by Louise Vos. And it is published by one of my favorites, Tiger Tales. Yeah, Snarly Hyssopus. Now one morning, Pelican met a new animal in the jungle. She'd never seen anything like it before. Hello, said Pelican. What kind of animal are you? I'm a hippopotamus, replied Hippopotamus. So Pelican flew off to tell Monkey. Guess what, said Pelican. I've seen a strange new animal. W what is it, asked Monkey. Well, Pelican tried to remember. It's a spotty hippomus she said. So Monkey swung off through the trees and found Zebra. Watch out, said Monkey. There's a huge, ugly creature heading this way. What is it? asked Zebra. It's a Wampa Bigga Mouse, said Monkey. And that's what Zebra thought it looked like. Well, Zebra found Leopard sleeping in the shade. Run, said Zebra. There's an enormous slimy beast and it's chasing me. What is it? asked Leopard. It's a, a, a drip of slobber mouth, cried Zebra. And that's what they thought it looked like. Leopard ran ahead and told Ant Eater, it's not safe. There's a hairy, hungry, snarling monster and I can hear it coming. Well, what is it? asked Ant Eater. It's a, 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 a gripper snapper tooth, said Leopard. And that's what Ant Eater thought it looked like. Well, Ant Eater told the alarming news to Giraffe. Oh, look out. There's a gigantic pink jelly thing coming and it will swallow you whole. What is it? asked Giraffe, trembling at the knees. It's a, a, a gulp of wobble stocks, said Ant Eater. And that's what he thought it looked like. Now Giraffe found Elephant taking his nap. Wake up! Wake up! panted Giraffe. A terrible, roaring, clawing, wild-eyed monster is going to gobble us all up. Elephant opened his eye. Just one. What kind of monster is it? He yawned. It's a snarly hyssopus. Well, Elephant wiggled his ears and said he wasn't scared of monsters. So he sent Giraffe to bring all the animals to the high hill. Now listen, he said, this is my plan. We'll all hide, and when the monster comes, we'll jump on it, push it, bump it, and shove it downhill to the muddy brown creek, and that will teach it a lesson. Well, after a little while, they heard something moving in the bushes. The monster was coming. So, on a signal from Elephant, they all jumped on it. And pushing and bumping and shoving with all their might, they rolled the monster downhill to the muddy brown creek. Splash! And Hippopotamus rolled over in the warm, squishy mud. 
Oh, lovely, he said. Elephant stared. But you're not a monster. Where's the snarly hyssopus? Oh, I think you're a bit mixed up, said Hippopotamus, giggling. I'm a hippopotamus, and hippopotamuses love mud baths. Have you ever tried one yourself? Well, none of them had. So they all jumped into the muddy brown creek, and before long, it was hard to tell which of them was a hippopotamus and which was a, well, what on earth -a -mus. And that's the end. <laughs> well, let's do another finger play. And I think we could do one. Hmm. We did have a monkey in there, didn't we? So maybe we, this time we could have the monkeys up in a tree. Same five fingers, but up in the tree. Five little monkeys swinging in the tree, teasing Mr. Crocodile, you can't catch me. Well, along comes Mr. Crocodile, as hungry as can be, and he goes, snap! But you know what that monkey did? He hid. Four little monkeys were swinging in the tree, teasing Mr. Crocodile, you can't catch me. Along comes Mr. Crocodile, as hungry as can be, and he goes, snap! So now there are three little monkeys swinging in the tree, teasing Mr. Crocodile, you can't catch me. Along comes Mr. Crocodile, as hungry as can be, and he goes, snap! So now two little monkeys are swinging in the tree, teasing Mr. Crocodile, you can't catch me. Along comes Mr. Crocodile, as hungry as can be, and he goes, snap! So that means one little monkey is swinging in the tree, teasing Mr. Crocodile, you can't catch me. Along comes Mr. Crocodile, as hungry as can be, and he goes, snap! So now there are no little monkeys swinging in the tree. I'd better watch out so he won't catch me. <laughs> well, we're gonna have a story now about something I know all of you have. You may have had just a couple, or maybe a whole lot. It's a birthday story. This is called The 10 Rules of a Birthday Wish. It's written by Beth Ferry, with pictures by Tom Lichtenheld, and it's published by Putnam. I'm not sure if it's Elephant's birthday. I guess we'll have to read and find out. There are there are, most definitely are, 10 very specific, tried and true, absolutely essential rules for making a birthday wish. 10, that's two hands. Can you put both hands up? If you had the book, you could put one hand here and one hand here. So there'd be no confusion about how many rules there are. Rule number one, it must be your birthday or close to your birthday. Sometime in the last or next week, your age will have increased by one. And unless you're a beetle or a bug or an insect, if your life cycle's a month or a week or only a single day, celebrate immediately. ASAP, as soon as possible. Flutter, flap, fly, right on over to rule number two. Rule number two, you must have a party. A celebration, hoopla, or jamboree. There should be games and laughter and definitely hats. Hats immediately elevate the party mood. And food is also a good idea. See rule number three. As are streamers, confetti, and balloons. Unless... You're a rhinoceros, pop. Oopsie. If you are a rhinoceros, a swordfish, a sea urchin, or a, at all pointy in any way, you may want to skip the balloon. Pop, pop. Rule number three, you must have cake 
or cannoli or cream puffs or churros. Your dessert does not specifically have to start with the letter C, even though some of the best desserts do. It could be a P or a B or even an I. Whatever letter your dessert starts with, it must be sturdy enough to accommodate rule number four. And rule number four is you must have a light or lights to blow out. Look at all those candles. <gasps> Traditionally, this would be a candle, but it could also be a sparkler. Unless, of course, you're a whale or a frog. Because if you're a whale, you might want to invite some fluorescent jellyfish to your party. And if you're a frog, consider using fireflies as your candles and your dessert. Combining rules is completely acceptable. Either way, something light must be able to go dark. Rule number five, there must be singing. Traditionally, the happy birthday song, sung happily and loudly and definitely off key, unless your friends are feathered. Because if you're lucky enough to have friends who can warble, croon, and carry a tune, just sit back and enjoy the show. If I could whistle well, I'd whistle happy birthday because that's what they're doing. They're singing and whistling. Rule number six, you must close your eyes. Closing your eyes keeps your wish safe inside your head where it can grow from something ordinary into something extraordinary. Rule number seven, you must take a deep breath. This will ensure the success of rule number nine, unless you're a puffer fish. Because if you're a puffer fish, definitely do not take a big breath because then you will puff up and all your guests will be concerned. Everyone knows a puffed up puffer fish is not a happy puffer fish and happy is a big part of birthday. Rule number eight, you must make a wish. Just one wish, a single wonderful amazing wish. It can be a big wish or a little wish. It can be a now wish or later wish, but it should definitely be a can't think of anything greater wish. Rule number nine, you must blow out the candles in one single breath, <sighs> unless you're a camel. If you're a camel, you will most likely spit on the cake as you are blowing out the candles. And no one wants to eat cake spritzed with camel spit. So please ask your friends to help. Combining breaths is completely acceptable. And rule number 10, don't forget that wish ends with a shh. So keep your wish quiet, silent. Hush, hush. And when the fun is done and your friends have left and the moon is high in the sky, close your eyes and dream of your wish coming true. I wonder what he wished for. It's his secret. Maybe he wished for some bubble gum. He might have. So can you reach in your pocket? I think it's time for us to do our bubble gum and pull out your piece of pretend bubble gum. Take a look at it. If it has a wrapper on it, you don't want to eat that. So unwrap it, toss that wrapper in the trash and pop the gum in your mouth and chew it up until it's all soft and squishy. done. So put your hand out. Let's do the disgusting part. Now count to three and spit your gum in your hand. One, two, three. And clap your other hand on top. And now your hands are stuck together with sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your chin. On stick. Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your arm. On stick, 
Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your cheek. On stick, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your back. On stick. Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your nose. On stick. Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your knee. On stick. Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on mom or dad. On stick. Come on back. Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your toe. On stick. Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum. It's time to throw it in the trash. Well, our next story is going to be about, well, it's going to sound like a story you might already know, but it's got some very different characters. This is called The Three Little Aliens and the Big Bad Robot. This is written by Margaret McNamara and illustrated by Mark Fearing. Looks like we're gonna go out in space. And this is published by Schwartz and Wade Books. You see the big claw coming down and the three little aliens. Once there was a mama alien who had three little aliens they were called Bork, Gork, and Nigglewilts. That's what it says here. Now, Bork, Gork, and Nigglewilts grew up in an old-fashioned house in a snug, cozy crater on a tiny little planet. And as the eons passed, their house got too crowded. It's time for you to go out into the universe and find a planet of your own, their mama told them, giving each a hug. But remember, watch out for the big bad robot. It wants to chew you up. So Bork, Gork, and Nibblewitz took off. Bye, Mama, they cried. Bye, kids, she shouted back. Always stick together, she added. And then she sniffed a little bit. And call me every once in a while. Now the three little aliens traveled far and fast. There's a cute planet, said Bork. Oh, too hot, said Nigglewitz. Oh, what about that one, cried Gork. Hmm, too crowded. They darted around the meteor. Are we there yet, asked Bork. Well, just past the next bend, a big planet swirling with dust loomed into view. Bork spotted a shiny space rover zipping around its mountains and plains. Awesome! She said, I'm going to live in that. But Ma said to stick together, called Nigglewitz. Well, Nigglewitz and Gork traveled on. Nigglewitz didn't like the looks of the next planet either. There's nowhere to breathe, he gasped. Oh, picky, picky, said Gork. Then just ahead, he spied a giant planet with huge golden rings around it. He jumped on a passing satellite and he caught a ride on the ring. Whee! He squealed. This is what I call home. Well, we can't live on a ring that goes around in circles, yelled Nigglewoods. We'll get dizzy. But Gork wasn't paying any attention. Now Nigglewoods was all alone. He traveled deeper and deeper into space until he spotted a massive blue planet far out in the galaxy. It had 13 moons and refreshing breezes. This faraway place is where I'll build my home, he said. It will be safe from the big bad robot. Well, Nibblewitz 
found everything he needed to make sturdy walls. And he gathered stardust to keep his home bright. And he found some solar panels to keep it warm. And then he grabbed a tall, skinny telescope. This'll do for a chimney, he thought, though no one heard him. Well, by rock by rock and row by row, Nigel Willits built the perfect house. And when he was finished, he sat down and locked the door. His house was not very zippy or cool, but it was very safe. And there was room enough for all three little aliens. I hope they come to visit soon, said Nickel Woods. Well then, one galactic dawn, there was a rumbling in the universe. Creep, bong, meep, Italy, deep, ark, Eep. It was the big bad robot. Now Bork was so busy on her swirly red planet that she couldn't hear the robot's call. She didn't feel its giant footsteps as it leaped from star to star. And she didn't see the robot until it was right in front of her. Little alien, little alien, bleeped the robot. Pull over, pull over. Mm, not by the wheels of my trusty space rover, cried Bork bravely. Then I'll crack and I'll smack and I'll whack your house down, meeped the robot. And just like that, the robot cracked and smacked and whacked Bork's shiny rover into oh, a hundred pieces. And as fast as the speed of sound, Bork jetted away, the robot close behind her. And just as the robot was about to eat her up, she spotted Gork's satellite house. Gork, Gork, help me, she cried. But Gork was having so much fun surfing on the rings of his giant planet that he didn't hear Bork's cries. He didn't see the robot chomping on comets and ripping open black holes until the big bad robot had caught Gork's satellite in its huge metal claw. Little alien, little alien, it roinked. Come out of hiding. Not by the orbit of this ring I'm riding, cried Gork stoutly. Then I will shatter and clatter and scatter your house down, groinked the robot. And before Gork could fly beneath the radar, that robot clattered and scattered and shattered Gork's satellite into a thousand pieces. Gork barely escaped. Over here, called Bork. Stick together. And at the speed of light, Bork and Gork blasted out into space with the big bad robot getting closer all the time. Where can we hide? Asked Gork. Let's find Nigglewitz, cried Bork. He'll know what to do. Well, Nigglewitz, what hadn't heard of the robot's roar. He had seen what was going on with his brother and his sister through his telescope, and he was ready. He flashed his solar panels halfway across the universe. There he is, cried Bork and Gork, and they zoomed to Needlewood's house as fast as a hurtling asteroid. Get inside, said Needlewood. No time to waste. Well, no sooner had Bork and Gork slammed into Nigglewood's solid space rock door than they heard the robot rumbling. Little alien, little alien, it queaked. Let me come in. Not by the slime on my chinny chin chin, cried Nigglewood. Then I will smack and crack and whack your house down, zeeped the robot. Well, the big bad robot bashed and crashed Nigglewood's strong, solid house, but nothing happened. And then it pounded and smashed really hard. Not a crack. 
and then it loaded up its triple blaster and zapped the house but good. But that house would not fall down. So the robot forced its way into the little alien's house right down the chimney. And the aliens covered their ears and waited for the robot to chomp them up. Creep, buddy. But halfway down the telescope, that robot got stuck tight. It strained and it struggled, it moaned and it groaned. Nigglewitz's house shook and shuddered, but did it fall down? What do you think? It did not. The robot gave one more mighty cry and burst, poof, into a million pieces. Cool, said Bork. Awesome, said Gork. Just as I planned, said Nigglewitz. There's just one thing missing, said Bork. Phone home, said Gork. So Nigglewitz did. Ma, he said, we have the coziest house in the galaxy. Won't you come over and tuck us in? And you know what? She did. I think I'd like to meet those aliens. They looked like they were kind of fun. Well, I think it's time for our flannel board stories. Can you wiggle your fingers? And wiggle your toes? And wiggle your shoulders? How about your nose? Can you wiggle your elbows? And slap your knees? And stretch your arms up and then get ready, please, for a classic flannel board story that, well, I felt I had to share today. Some of you will know why, and some can just enjoy it. All right. Well, let's get this straight here. In the light of the moon, on a leaf, lay a little white egg. And one Sunday morning, when the warm sun came out, pop, out of that egg came a very tiny and very hungry caterpillar. He started to look for some food. Now on Monday, he ate through one red apple. But he was still hungry. So on Tuesday, he ate through two pears. But he was still hungry. So on Wednesday, he ate through one, two, three plums. But he was still hungry. So on Thursday, he ate through, oh, these are coming into season here, four strawberries. but he was still hungry. So on Friday, he ate through one, two, three, four. Five oranges. But he was still hungry. So on Saturday, he ate through one piece of chocolate cake, one ice cream cone, one pickle, one slice of Swiss cheese, one slice of salami, one lollipop, one piece of cherry pie, one sausage, one cupcake, and one slice of watermelon. Where is he? Let's have him do it. And that night, he had a stomach ache. Well, the next day was Sunday again, and the caterpillar ate his way through one nice big green leaf. And he wasn't hungry anymore. He also wasn't little anymore. 
he was a big, fat caterpillar. Well, he built a little house for himself called a cocoon, and he stayed inside of it for two whole weeks. Then he nibbled a hole in the end, and he pushed himself out. And he was a beautiful butterfly. And that's what happens to very hungry caterpillars. Thank you, Eric Carl, for sharing that with us. All right, so let's finish up with our Pajama Time book by Sandra Boynton. They're ready to dance. Are you ready to dance off to bed? Well, the moon is up and it's getting late. Let's get ready to celebrate. It's pajama time. Pull on the bottoms, pull on the top, get yourself to pajama de bop. It's pajama time. Now some are old and some are new. Some are red and some are blue. Some are fuzzy, some are not. But we can pajama in whatever we've got. It's pajama time. Oh, yes, it's pajama time. Now, some are pink and some are green and some are the ugliest you've ever seen. They might be stripy or polka dot, but we can all pajama in whatever we've got. It's pajama time. So pajama to the left and pajama to the right. Jamma, 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 PJ. Everybody's wearing them for dancing tonight. Jamma, 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 PJ. Now all around the room in one big line, wearing our pajamas and looking so fine. It's pajama time. So then hop into bed and turn out the light. You can have a party in your dreams tonight. It's pajama time. Hush, hush. It's pajama time. It's pajama time. Shh. Good night. Sleep tight. The end. Thanks for watching, and we'll be back again next week with some more stories for your bedtime.